Bibles with me, please, to 1 John chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 5 to the end of verse 10. 1 John chapter 1 from verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Well, let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the theme that's run through our service this morning because it speaks of you as the God of light. We thank you that here in this place today our praise for you can fill the room. It's our greatest joy to worship you and to bring you the admiration of our hearts and the consecration of our lives. And we thank you that as our Heavenly Father, you know us through and through and that through your word you can reach and speak to us and use your word to transform us. And so we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, your instruction in this passage of Scripture that we read and study today will minister to us through the grace and teaching of the Lord Jesus. So we come with our eyes upon you and our hearts full of affection for you. And our wills bowed before you in expectation that you'll speak to us through John's letter. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in this new series of messages that we've begun in 1 John, we've entitled them Fellowship with God and Believers. And last Sunday, we looked particularly at the basis of our fellowship. And we saw that, of course, to be the gospel. Our fellowship is founded upon the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel message, and therefore our faith also, hinges on the incarnation. That the Jesus of heaven came into this world in order to save sinners. That's foundational to our fellowship. In Colossians we read, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So our fellowship is with God and with his son, the Lord Jesus, and with each other. And here in this place, we, we cannot have fellowship with each other until we have embraced by faith the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We cannot have fellowship with God unless we have fellowship with each other. I love it when I go from here to churches somewhere else, in a different country or in a different city. And I, I hear people say things like this, I just love my church. It's the greatest church anywhere. It's a sign that they've developed this God-given addiction to the fellowship of which we spoke last week. And they love being with the people of God. And John's telling us in this letter that this fellowship is part of the rich blessings that we have in Christ. And part of what makes the fellowship wonderful, of course, is the fact that you are here, actively engaged in the life and the ministry of the church. You're a, a vital part of this fellowship. And the local church is so much like any other family. In our families, 
we care for one another, we pray for one another, we correct one another. And when one of the children faces disappointment, we encourage them with words of comfort. When one of the children falls and skins their knees, we rush to their aid and help them up. And when one of the children throws a tantrum and spits the dummy, we lovingly correct them and pull them into line. There are a number of things that I've noticed over the years that seem to be characteristic of people who live with this healthy addiction to Christian fellowship in the life of the church. People who have this addiction embrace newcomers, and they try to encourage new and struggling Christians in the church because they have experienced the blessing and the richness of fellowship, and they want others to enjoy it. And people who have this addiction refuse to leave when the going gets tough. They stay in an effort to help the church grow through a difficult time. And they draw alongside the weaker, less mature believer who stumbles and falls and helps them to a better place in their Christian pilgrimage. And people with this addiction don't tend to move from church to church too readily. I know there are times when people do that, but not, not too readily. Because they love the church, because they know that Jesus loves the church, warts and all. And He gave Himself for the church. And these people want to do their part in helping it become the very best church it can possibly be. And people who have this addiction love the church where they are because they believe that this is where God has placed them and where God intends to bless them. This fellowship into which we've been called and placed by God is a communal experience. It precludes the Christian living in isolation from the church. I've had people say to me in the past on different occasions, something like this, I don't need to go to church, I can be church by myself. You will live, I will live my Christian life as a solitary individual, but to do that is to spit in the face of the Savior who gave His lifeblood for this community to create and to put in place the church. And John's pointing out that if you don't realize the privilege that you have of being brought into the fellowship of the church family, all you will see when you look at the church is people. All you will see is someone who looks like you or not so much like you, someone who talks like you or perhaps a little strangely, some who are so much younger than you, some so much older than you, you'll just see people. And if that's all you see, it's because you don't see Jesus. What was John's motive in writing to these believers? Well, he wrote to promote and to complete their mutual joy, their joy in hearing the truth and his joy in seeing them listening to and embracing the Scriptures and living by the truth. Well, he echoes Jesus' thoughts. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So in other words, John's joy and theirs in this fellowship will be complete as they remain faithful to the Christian basics of true doctrine, obedient living, and fervent devotion to Christ. And that's what it's about here. That's why we're here. That's what we do in the life of the church. And having established that common ground that we need in order to fellowship with one another and with God, he details what this fellowship involves. And notice where he begins. He begins where most in our society refuse to begin. He begins with what is perhaps the biggest difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. 
He begins with God. And our Western world no longer begins with God. Ever since the 17th century, when René Descartes convinced the world to think about themselves, God has been gradually sidelined. And for God to be set aside leaves us with ourselves. That's all we have left. And the change is reflected in universities around the world, which once had departments of divinity where the students studied God. They've been replaced by departments of religion, where students study man as a religious being. Then these influential institutions that shape the thinking of our young men and women, men, man-centeredness has become the supreme message of our time. And if you don't begin with God, all you are left with is man. So it's important here that John speaks to these believers about what he believes to be their need to have a God-centered life. And so he begins by showing them the importance. And this is relevant. This is relevant. This starting with God is relevant to our neighbors. It's relevant to our colleagues. It's relevant to our workplace colleagues and our classmates because here in this particular time in which we live as the psalmist said God is not on their thoughts and he's explaining to them that being a Christian believer is dramatically different but if they were to ever think it may be in terms of the this one verse, people may, may think in terms of God, it would be in terms perhaps of that one verse that John mentions later on this, in this letter. You'll know the verse. People think of this one verse, God is love. But it's interesting that John doesn't begin there with God is love. Why is that? It's because I think he, he realizes we don't understand what he means by God is love. There's a famous children's program that our children grew up with in, uh, called Mr. Rogers. I don't know whether you've ever heard of Mr. Rogers, but they grew up with him. And Mr. Rogers had this one saying, this one statement that he made every single week at the end of the program. This is what he said to the children. I like you just the way you are. John is saying here, God is not Mr. Rogers. God is love. That doesn't make him Mr. Rogers. God doesn't say, I love you just the way you are. You're fine the way you are. You don't need to change. Live as you like. I'm not terribly concerned. Because that wouldn't be love. That would be indifferent. So John begins with a general principle or truth. He says, God is light. He says here in verse 5, this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And the reason he begins here is because he's going to transition into your life and mine. He's going to transition into our ethics and into our conduct and into our motivations and into our thoughts and into our deeds and into our misdeeds. And as he works within the framework, he first needs to establish who God is. Because if you're dealing with the particular sins and temptations in your life, you don't need, the, you don't need tips and motivations and inspiration from self-help books. You don't need that. If you're struggling and dealing with sin and temptation and the things that are just got you in their grip, you first need to have a clear understanding of God. And the reason our culture cannot agree on morality and ethics and law is because there is no common agreement on who God is. And the reason John begins by saying God is light, meaning purity and holiness, is because real love is always holy. Light illuminates the darkness. 
Light is truth. It exposes sin and rebellion and folly. It heals and it brings life. And our God who is called light and dwells in light is a righteous God who is jealous for his children and for their love in response to his unconditional expression of love toward them in the cross. And the Bible speaks of God's love as a jealous love. And you know, if our love is not a jealous love, it's not love. If it's not righteously jealous, it's not love. And real love always gives itself to the object of its love, absolutely. Absolutely. Real love always seeks to protect the object of its love from harm and hurt and error, even at its own expense. John means God is all-consuming in His passion to give Himself to us. All-consuming as He has demonstrated in sending Jesus, His his righteous, holy love is all-giving. In a gloriously loving way, it's all demanding. Because this God of light demands everything from you. Demands everything from me. What does He want from you more than anything else? You. Every part. Nothing to be held back. There's nothing more frightening in all the world than God's love. Because it's a love that holds us accountable. There's nothing more restful in all the world than walking in His light. So if God is light and we have fellowship with God, then we too live in the light. It's a restful place peaceful place. So fellowship with God is only possible as we walk in the light. He says if we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie. We don't practice the truth. Have you ever felt like a fish out of water? I remember when I was five years of age, the Mouseketeers were coming to town. And on that particular day, my three sisters, who are older than, or two of them older than myself, They had a brilliant idea. They had a brilliant idea that on that particular day, they needed to practice curling their hair. And they thought a great idea would be to practice on their five-year-old brother. So after convincing me by promising me all kinds of special treats, and I remember this day vividly, it's, it's marked me this day, They wash my hair, set it in curlers, while I hoped that no one, especially my friend Russell across the street, would see me. And I remember coming, emerging from the bathroom with a head of, thick head of hair at the time, thick hair, fair hair, massive curls. I looked like Annie. And I thought, this is shocking because I'm going to go out here into the world, the Mouseketeers are coming, and what will Annette think? I felt like a fish out of water. I felt so embarrassed. I felt so out of place. They never told me that if I just simply ran my head under the hot water, it would all go away. Have you ever felt like a fish out of water? Totally out of place? totally uncomfortable. I learned two things on that day. I learned what it means to feel like a fish out of water, and I learned that sisters are not to be trusted. Now, that's exactly how a Christian feels when he or she strays into the realm of darkness and seeks fellowship there, completely out of place, completely conspicuous by his or her presence in a foreign environment. Christian can never feel comfortable in an environment of darkness. And in this passage, John is saying three simple things about knowing God and having fellowship with this God who is light and in whom there is no darkness at all. He's going to refute three erroneous, false attitudes towards sin. 
in verse 6, 8, and 10, he says, if we say or if we claim, and these were apparently expressed by the false teachers who had left the church and were still seeking to impress and to influence those within the church. Because some said, I can be a Christian and continue in my sinful lifestyle. And some said, we are Christians, but we are Christians who no longer have any problem with sin. And a third group who said, we are Christians and we have never had a problem with sin. If we say we have fellowship with Him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. He's, he's talking here about this continuous, present tense lifestyle of sin. This is the person who says, I'm a Christian thief. I'm a Christian liar. I'm a Christian adulterer. I'm a Christian idolater. I have always been and I always will be but I'm a Christian. No, you're not. No, you're not. Not according to John. Your life is not true. You're false. You lie. You don't practice the truth. You're hiding behind a mask and you're deceiving yourself. But if you're a Christian and you walk in the light, you will not want to continue in that sinful lifestyle. You will feel out of place. You'll be repulsed by what is revealed in the light. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So when you and I come under the light of the essence of God, he reveals the essence of our character and exposes it for what it is. And the paradox of being part of the fellowship of a local church is that the more ready we are to acknowledge our sins to our Heavenly Father and to seek His forgiveness, the closer our fellowship becomes with fellow believers. And we discover the blessing experienced by those who acknowledge their sin as sin and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The old hymn, Rock of Ages, has a wonderful expression in it. It says, be of sin the double cure, save me from its guilt and power. That's what we need. We need both the forgiveness of our sins and the cleansing of our hearts from the dominion of particular sins so that we may be free to love and to serve the Lord Jesus. This is what John offers us in the gospel of Jesus. But the tragedy of walking in the darkness is that while you're in the darkness, there is not enough light for you to know that there is a world of light outside your darkness. so that you go on struggling with your sin or seeking therapy to deal with your sin or reading another self-help book to cope with your sin. Or you try to hide your sin or to compensate for your sin. And John is saying there is an abundance of grace in our Lord Jesus Christ because He is all sufficient to bring forgiveness for our sins and all powerful to release us from the grip of our sin. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. There's the question, are you happy in Jesus? If not, what are you hiding from Him in the darkness? So John encourages us to walk in the light and tells us that fellowship with God is only possible as we walk in the light. And then he says freedom from sin is only possible if we confess it to the Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. These people who were leaving the church and trying to influence the church with their false teachings considered themselves to be living on a higher plane. They said we have no sin. 
They were saying, we are Christians who no longer have a problem with sin. There's a name for that. It's called perfectionism. I remember uh, meeting someone a few years ago, a lot of years ago, when I was a younger pastor who told me they had not sinned for the last several years, by which they sinned. Because their very claim was false. Because we know that there are sins that we openly commit, but there are also sins of omission that we're told about. John says, if you say you have no sin, you're self-deceived. They were self-deceived, and there's no greater deceit than self-deceit. You see how John explains it? He says, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. He means, if you claim to have no sin, reality is not in you. They were self-deceived. And if you're saying, I'm not really a sinner, I don't need saving, then you are utterly deceived. And you're out of touch with reality. Are you hiding behind a mask? Are you deceiving yourself today? But on the other hand, John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And perhaps you fear, as I think many people fear, is that if you confess your sin, God will strike you down. You see, God has graciously given us His only Son in order to pay for the price of your sin, to shed His blood on the cross, and to save you and to save me from our sin. Which is why many in this room today have found peace and joy in their lives. They've discovered that God is faithful to keep His promise to cleanse and to forgive and to set you free from the bondage of sin. They've discovered that. They've experienced relief from guilt of sin and, and release from its power to control their lives. And they've discovered that He is faithful to keep His promise to forgive your sins. And when John adds something equally wonderful now, we need to take note of it. Something perhaps even more wonderful than what He has just said to this list of blessings. You see what He says? He says, not only is God faithful to forgive our sins through the shed blood of Christ, furthermore, He is just to forgive our sins. You know what God's saying? Forgiveness of sins is a matter of justice with me. Not that you receive His justice for your sins, but that Jesus receives justice on your behalf. And God says, when you come to confess your sin to me, I would be unjust toward you if I didn't forgive you. If I didn't pardon you on the basis of what Christ has accomplished. The infinitely just, righteous, holy God who hates sin is at His most just when He pardons the sins of those who believe and trust in Jesus. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a tryst as a private romantic rendezvous between lovers. In her famous hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, Elizabeth Clefane describes the cross of Jesus Christ as the trysting place where God's love and God's justice meet for you. We are to walk in the light if we are to have fellowship with God. We are to willingly confess our sins if we are to enjoy freedom from it. And then finally, he says, if we say we have not sinned, then we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Earlier in this chapter, he said that if we do not sin, if we say we do not sin, then we are liars. But now look what he's saying. He says, if we say, I have never had a problem with sin, I'm actually saying God is the liar. I am the truth. And I don't care what God says. And you see, I don't care what God says about the condition of my heart. 
to the man or woman or young person who stubbornly resists the word of grace in the gospel that exposes my sin and then calls me to repentance and faith and to experience the glory of sins forgiven and sins dominion over my life being brought to an end, the one who makes God the liar, John says of him or of her, the word is not in him and I have nothing more to say. John learned that from Jesus. When he came before Pilate, he had a conversation. When he was brought before Herod, he said nothing. There was nothing more to be said. I think that is what the Scriptures call the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. When you so resist the testimony of the Holy Spirit to the grace of God in Jesus Christ that you don't actually care anymore. And one of the evidences that I was in danger of that would be that I could sit in church week after week and month after month. And it really doesn't matter what is said. It doesn't go, it's not going to penetrate. Because I'm really saying, you are a lie. And I am the truth. And John's saying his word is not us. You see, if if you can remain detached from what happens here in our worship as we gather together, you are spiritually in the most dangerous place you could ever be. Even though you may feel as if you're in the safest place of all. Because nothing penetrates and nothing moves you. And John is saying, oh, my dear friend, don't you understand? You may be on the verge of God never again choosing to speak to you because you have so pressed him out of your life and said to him by your actions, I am going to treat you as the liar and I will despise your word and it's not going to make the slightest difference in my life. But the good news, The good news is that his word does penetrate. And I say, oh God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And he gives forgiveness. Oh, the bliss of that glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. May I plead with you today that if you have resisted the Word of God to this point in your life, to this moment today, that you bow before him humbly and seek the salvation that is in Christ. Would you pray with me? God, give us a hunger for your word, a thirst for righteousness, a desire to be in your presence, fellowship with your people and teach us Lord day by day to walk in obedience to what your word teaches us as we bask in the grace of God in the gospel that our lives might be a blessing to those around us and I pray it in Jesus name